do really evil if I wanted to right now. <laughs> I've got this. Oh my god! Yes, that's Paul and I's play. I know. Look at that. That was our first thing we ever did together. You're amazing to have found that. Somebody scanned it and sent it to me. I can't remember who. Wow. Look, look at those babies. Aw. There's Buzz off. Yeah, he looked like that. Yeah. <laughs> distinguished. You look distinguished now, both of you. That's, yeah, that's the right word. Hello, hello, hello. There you all are. Hi, 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 hi. I like how Sid serenades you all on the way in. I like to do that. So welcome to the Sid City Social Club for Friday, March 26th. And I think I'm going to throw it first to Sid. Oh, hi. <laughs> that was quick. <laughs> I was totally, my mind was somewhere else. I was just saying, just reading all the highs from everybody. Hi, everybody. Good to see you all. It's really lovely to see you all, in fact. Um, oh, I'm nearly finished with this film. I'm so happy. I've got three days left to make it go home. I'm really looking forward to it. We did some stuff with wolves. Oh my goodness, what amazing creatures they are. Um, I've, I've never seen them up close before. I've, I've seen them lots on TV, but they are a lot bigger than they look on TV. And uh, they are quite magnificent. Um, we'll talk about them later, because we've got lots to do today. One of my favorite, two of my favorite people in the world talk to each other, and I'm hopefully going to get all over that as well. Um, uh, one of, both of whom are two of my oldest friends, which is saying something because it's going to be about 30 years that we know each other. Um, and one of them was actually in my first ever job in the world uh, on stage uh, called Paul. And um, you'll meet him in a second. So let's get cruising. All right. We're going to cruise over to Colin, who is going to interview. He's going to conduct this interview of old friends. An so interview. Yes. Hello. Colin and Paul, you're up. Welcome to uh, News at 10. <laughs> like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Um, Paul, yeah, Paul, Mr. Maisie, I know Sid because of Paul. True uh, that. Because they, uh, they as, as it said, they uh, worked together in uh, Manchester Library Theatre. And we were at, Paul and I were at drama school together. And um, I don't know if you know this, actually, but originally Paul and I were going to, we were thinking about going to London together as flatmates. And I couldn't get out of my flat lease. So he was like, oh, I'll settle for Sid. So he took Sid to London instead. And then <laughs> I moved in around the corner and uh, ended up playing lots of games and watching Next Gen with these two lovely people. Um, I have got uh, some uh, things to show you as well. So Paul and Sid, feel free to jump in. So this is, um, uh, Mel's got a brilliant shot of, uh, of the actual programme. So there we go. Mr. Baisley. And Sid, first ever job, front page of the uh, Manchester Evening News. <laughs> and look at their little faces. Look, look at, look at the hair. Look at the it hair. looks like we were in like Depeche mode, but. Uh... <laughs> we're, we're, I'm the least scary Israeli guard that you've literally <laughs> ever seen. Sid looked a bit more scary than me. But look how they've spelt our names. They've spelt both our names really badly wrong at the bottom. Oh, yeah, that's true. Paul Bailey and Sid Old Fodil. <laughs> what, do you two, what do you two remember about that job? <sighs> we it were pretty both, bored, Paul. Yeah, we were. It was both of our first jobs in theatre, so it was really exciting to be, you know, I remember, and they used to pay us in cash, and we used to get a little pay packet at the end of the week. I remember I used to get this little envelope, and it had cash in it. Um, and I just thought they're paying us to act. It's just mad. But we had to have <laughs> one thing that I still remember where um, I had to sit on stage guarding Alan and Alan had a massive, like a five minute monologue. And I had to look off stage down the, into the wings and Sid every night decided that he would try and make me laugh because he was in the wings. And it got to the point where <laughs> he, he, he had puppets I seem to remember he had a small puppet at one point. He also had, I was pretty good. I didn't crack, but there was one night that, I mean, it was all about the Holocaust. So there was these piles of shoes, you know, very moving, you know, piles of shoes on the set of people who had died in the Holocaust. And Sid managed to climb under the set and get these shoes like moving. Like, so there was suddenly like, and I knew he'd crawled under the set to get the shoes like going like that. And only I could see them. He got me that night. 
So I did a lot. I did a lot. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. The old fishing line trick. I tied fishing line to a shoe and just slowly pulled it towards me. And it just moved across the stage, but only Paul could see it. And there was another night. Um, and we were just, we didn't have anything to say. I mean, we had, we both had a monologue each. Didn't we? I mean, that was what, how it worked. And we, we got a, a little piece to say, two minute thing. And then they switched off us for the rest of the play. And we were just prison guards. Um, but this was a, a seen as a really anti-Semitic play when it came out. And to be honest with you, I was not political. I didn't know anything about any of this. And it struck me as really, wow, we're doing something people are protesting. And, Manchester has the second highest Jewish population in, in Great Britain, or at least it did have in, in the very early 90s. So we would get Orthodox uh, people who would come along to leave. So they would come just to stand up in the middle of the play and leave en masse and became kind of a, a, a thing. We would wait for it. We'd, we'd, we'd know it would come, it was coming. And sure enough, all these people would get up in the middle of the play and just exit as noisily as they could. Except my speech, I had the pleasure of being able to shoot a blank, a bunch of blanks on a, a semi-automatic machine gun. I can't remember what kind of gun it was, but I, you know, it was a, it was a piece where I got really intense and, and dramatic. And then I shot the machine gun at everybody. Um, and it just so happened that these guys were leaving just as I was shooting my machine gun. And they sat right back down again. <laughs> That, that night the rest of the time they all got to people whenever they felt like it so well, welcome to the life of bored actors obviously absolutely <laughs> i feel um so we move on from that so paul and sid have now met and they become flatmates down in tooting and paul has very kindly sent some photos i've shared this one before in the quiz this is sid in his amiga computer which was the thing that completely bonded us i had yeah. one he had one yeah and we used to game a lot um, we still can't quite work out what that game is that you're playing there. I think it's that wizard one. We love that wizard one. I can't remember what it was called. But I was, because I'm a rubbish gamer, um, and so I was literally a spectator. So we would sit, because we were unemployed actors, and uh, we would sit all day, all night, and I would just be spectating, going, oh, no, no, you went left last time. Go right, because that's where the, the, the goblin is or whatever. And it was... Um, the most bizarre lifestyle because i think i think you're right paul i think it's the wizard one isn't it yeah i think it's a dnd one of the dnd type games that came out at that time not one that i played i was doing different ones and i think oh this is lovely explain this photo paul this is lovely but this was sid might not remember but we, he, there was one we were there over christmas and he decided to make all his friends and family christmas cards so he literally he was so sickening because he got out all these paints. And I just thought, well, I knew he was a great actor. He was a great director. And he's a bloody brilliant painter. He painted all these really beautiful little cards with kind of... With kind. It was so annoying. I was like, oh, come on. Can't you just go and buy some from the shop? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, was a very, it felt very Christmassy. God, I look like my son there. It's really wild. You really do. That was the first yeah. thing that I thought. Exactly. You know, I, think you were, I think you were growing that beard for um, Lawrence after Arabia. Oh yeah, for a dangerous man. That makes yeah, enormous makes sense. sense. You went, you went to film it while we were there. Wow. And do you do you remember Paul when you first found out that Sid had got Star Trek? Do you remember where you were and how you found out? Oh yes, I do because he kept it as a secret from me because <laughs> I got a job, a real dream job of touring the United States for four months with the National Theatre in Ian McKellen's production of Richard III. Which and, I saw. Yeah, exactly. Which, and it was the first time I'd ever got a job at the National and it was with Ian who was already, he wasn't a movie star then, but he was probably the most famous stage actor of, of the time. And um, we were touring, we started in New York and we ended in LA and we went right across the country for four months. It was incredible. But due, right at the beginning, when I was in New York, Sid got the part and he didn't tell me. So that by the time I got to LA, he was living in LA. He had a flat and he just showed up. He showed up at our first night in LA. It was like, I was like, what the hell are you doing here? And he went, oh, I live here now. <laughs> I was like, who's in our flat? That is, that that, is yeah. you two at that the first night. That's it. 
That is us. Oh, God, Paul, you're so adorable. And it was so great because also Patrick Stewart showed up, of course, because he's big friends with Ian McKellen. And Sid had already met him because he was a part of the Star Trek family by then. So I got introduced to Patrick Stewart, which was great. And um, yeah, it was a very good night, I remember. Mm. It was a beautiful play. And Patrick, I mean, uh, Ian McKellen, I talk about it sometimes. It, it, it had Richard III, had, there was a, a whole set table of um, a dining table with candles lit. And um, one of his, his party piece in the play was, I think he changed his costume. Um, with one arm uh, uh, incapacitated out of his costume while this while, uh, while he was I think lighting the candles or blowing them out as well all at the same time it was quite a wonderful thing to, to see during his speech I used to I was about to come on straight after that scene and I used to watch it every night because it was like a dance it was like that's when you saw his incredible physical skill because he was yeah. playing Richard with a stroke so with his whole left hand side of his body he, he didn't move he had it in his pocket but he hid it. It was like he was too proud to show it. So not only was he acting that, but he was acting that he was hiding it. And then when he'd, he'd bared his chest to Lady Anne to ask her to kill him. And then he did this whole speech of uh, to, to woo her and to win her. And he gradually got himself dressed with this one hand. And at the end, he had a little leather glove and he'd just put, throw it up in the air and just catch it on his hand and just put it on his hand like that. And then it was done and then he would pop his hat back on and he'd walk off. And it was... It was a tour de force every night. I mean, he was yeah. he was like that all the way through the play. It's incredible. So having said that, you can tell you could see how ambitious he was because when we played our first night in LA, he knew that everyone from the film industry was coming, and he hadn't done films at that point. And he was the most nervous I've ever seen anyone. He was so grumpy, sweating, and we were like, "Why is he?" You know, like while we, while we were in LA, he got given a prize by Jack Lemmon. And Jack Lemon said, this is the greatest actor I've ever seen. And we wow. were like, why is he worrying? Every night he had massive movie stars were sat were outside his dressing room waiting to meet him. And, you know, I, we met people. I met Robin Williams and Danny DeVito. All these people would just come every night, Meryl Streep, to, to, to meet him because they felt he was the greatest actor because he could do Shakespeare. And yet all he wanted was he wanted to get into movies. And you, I think then you see into the mind of someone who's always going to be at the top because that's, you know, he was never content with what, what he had. Yeah, super ambitious. And who's that? This is my sister. Oh my gosh, my, yes it is. She was a drama school student at the time. So I paid for her to come to LA because I knew she'd love LA. And of course, Sid was there. So Sid took us to Pinewood. No, Paramount. It was Paramount, wasn't it? Sorry. Yeah, Pinewood's in England. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it wouldn't have been fine. I mean, he would have taken it, obviously, but it was paramount. And so we got to drive through those famous gates, and then he took us to his trailer, and there's his trailer, there's his costume. And of course, my false chest. There's his false chest. And of course, it hadn't come out yet. It wasn't going to come out in England for at least a year or two more. So we got a peak. He took us around the set. And uh, yeah, it was a real thrill, particularly for her, because she was still a student at the time. Oh, she's lovely. So and what sweet. was amazing, I remember that set, though, like you took us on the set of The Bridge, and it was like a sort of little, it was like a funny little contraption, wasn't it? It only went down a few feet and then back yes. up. <laughs> I mean, it was a bit cheesy, but of course, on film, it looked fantastic. You know, I mean, it was real, it was a real eye opener of how those sort of things worked. I missed, I missed one out, which was again back in the two. Oh, that was your, oh, yeah. So this was a games night. That was back in Tooting, yeah. Back in Tooting. And then this was West Hollywood flat. So that was the flat, the first flat you had. Oh, yeah, and Garden was, Street. You noticed, like, all the brown paper in the corner because he'd literally just moved in. And I, I was just coming around the flat and he went, oh, look, I've lit some candles. And there was, like, nothing, just brown paper <laughs> where he'd gone and bought a load of stuff. <laughs> literally just got there. Yeah, there wasn't even a fridge. There's not, there was absolutely nothing. <laughs> it was <laughs> empty. It never occurred to me to actually hire a furnished apartment. <laughs> I was like, this is really cheap. But of course it had no furniture. So I'm going to move slightly on to Paul's career yes. because of that. What is that, Mr. Baisley? That is my pirate from Pirates of the Caribbean. So um, I, I auditioned for Pirates of the Caribbean. And when you audition for these things, they they you know when it's a big movie they don't tell you what it is and they and often they give you sides 
to, to, to do in the audition that are not the characters. They just go, this is a ton generic sides because it's all top, top secret. So I knew it was pirates, but I didn't know anything about it. And actually the, the sailor that, that, that was um, Spanish in the thing. And I just thought my Spanish accent's a bit ropey. So when I went in, I just chanced my arm and I said to the cast member, can I do it? Should I do it Indian? Because that is my heritage. And she said, oh yeah, that's a nice idea. So I did it Indian. And then about two weeks later, I got my agent got called and said, oh, you got pirates. I mean, oh, what? So what is it? Is it like a couple of days, you know, in Pinewood? And she was like, no, it's six months. You're going to Hawaii and then you're going, you're one of the main pirates in this movie. Um, you're one of Johnny's pirates. Uh, but like, and I said, but I haven't had a recall even. And she just said, yeah, Rob Marshall just liked you. He liked the fact you've done it Indian and he's going to put you in it. So off I went and it was a big, big adventure. I mean, that was literally on the Pacific Ocean. We were on a proper pirate ship on the Pacific Ocean. We were on the Black Pearl, actually. They'd re-rigged it for that film to be Blackbeard's ship, but it was the Black Pearl. And yeah, we, they said, and you know, I used to get there and I, they, I remember my first day on that set, on that ship, and, they, and it was a big fight with the zombies. And they went, um, listen, climb up that rigging. And then in the take, while the, like all hell was breaking loose, there's zombies fighting everyone, climb down. Uh, and then what you're going to do is you're going to use this thing and you're going to hit that zombie over their head, blah, blah, blah. And I said, can I, can I have a dagger between my teeth? And they said, yeah, if you want. And I just thought, this is it. I'm a pirate up the rigging with a dagger between my teeth. It's all over. I can just stop her. So um, it was, we had an amazing time. And Johnny was the most delightful person you've ever met, literally. And also, what was the other thing you wanted to say? You wanted to share a thing, the fact that every time you used to, before you got Pirates, obviously, you used to go for auditions quite often. And what would happen when you'd go into auditions? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I would go up for a part. Um, and what was weird, because me and Sid were flatmates, and then he went to the States. So he was out of the British scene for a long time. Um, but what was weird was I remember doing a show about two years after he was in the States, and the woman said to me, who I was working with, you really remind me of someone I was at drama school with. And I was like, who? And she went, it's this actor called Sidi Girl for Dylan. And I was like, well, he was my flatmate. That's why. Um, so that was weird. And then, of course, we started going up for similar parts. And I remember I was up for this really nice part in a British TV series. And it was some, it was the series finale of this show. I can't remember what show it was, but it was this doctor who went mad and then he got killed and he took hostages. And it was a brilliant, like, you know, one episode guest. And I remember Sid was back. He was kind of going between the States and, and London. And I bumped into him in Soho. And I went, Sid, oh, how are you? Yeah, I'm up for this really great role. I've got had a recall. And, and he just went, oh, sorry, mate. Because, of course, he'd already been offered it. <laughs> this was my bloody life, right? <laughs> so, so what they did, what they'd obviously done is they'd offered to Sid just straight away but obviously thought, well, we need a backup in case he says no or he's not available. So we'll audition all the other idiots and then <laughs> draw up a shortlist, get the, do the kind of recalls. And, you know, at the recall, the director was just like, he was literally he was just like, that's, that's beautiful. I mean, he was almost <laughs> in tears, you know. You always know you're never going to get that one. And then it was just like, he'd already offered it to Sid. <laughs> that's um, true that was, and funny enough i was up for something just the other day there's a big amazon series where um it's about an italian heist it's it's great fun and it's up for one of the regular parts he's a lawyer and and in the description it said he's indian but with burning green eyes and i just thought well since i've already been offered this one, <laughs> so let's hope he's still in bloody estonia because otherwise i might as well not bother but I did do the tape. I haven't heard. Sid, have you got any news on that? Uh, no, I'm not doing it. But okay. thank you, that. <laughs> I, I, I might still have a chance for that one. <laughs> yeah, get, get your agent on it, Sid, quick. Yeah, really funny. yeah, yeah, I told him. Oh, dear. That's really funny. What's that then? Oh, that was fun. That was Doctor Who. I don't know if any of you watched Doctor Who over there, but um, it was a Christmas special called The, the Doctor. The widow, the witch, and the no, the doctor, the widow, and the wardrobe. I think wardrobe. Was, yeah, and uh, I got the great thing about that is I got to, we we were playing these three like quite rubbish sort of um, stormtroopers on this planet um, where they arrived, and uh, I got to play with uh, opposite Bill Bailey, who was one of the others. I don't know if you know him over there. He's just won 
Dancing with the Stars, our version over here, and he's um, the funniest comedian you've literally, the funniest man you've ever met. Right. So there was me and this other comedian called Arabella Weir, and we played these. And the thing about my guy is that he had um, mother issues, and he just kept bursting into tears. So it was um, it was very sweet, very very funny, and the three of us had the best time. And the best bit was, I don't know if any of you watch it, but we were on a location, so we weren't we didn't interact with the doctor. We were part. Of Story, but in my lunch break, one of the runners said to me, "Do you want to see the TARDIS?" And we got to, we snuck on set on on the TARDIS because obviously they weren't using it. And you know, because Doctor Who, when I was a kid, it was a big, big deal. Big and, deal. Um, yeah, being in the being on the set of the TARDIS and playing with the little knobs, you know, pretending I was taking us back in time. Um, that didn't come out right, did it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> little witches. Um, was a, was a real thrill. So yeah, so that was a happy job. Now, am, am I allowed to share the fact that you were messaging me while you were auditioning for the next one? I, I, well, I, I just have. I so there we go. Oh yeah. <laughs> this one. Oh yeah. So <laughs> this is me in The Last Jedi. What was funny about this was that for The Last Jedi, what they were doing is they were just offering parts, but they wouldn't tell you what the part was because it was so top secret. So you basically had to go how long is it the filming dates and just work out because they just went it's yes or no do you want to do it that's it no questions nothing so they what they do is they get a load of british actors in to basically play very small roles that you wouldn't do in anything else but you'll do it because it's star wars and so my character only had i think it was about four days filming so i was like it's not going to be a great part so should i do it and they wouldn't tell me even if there was dialogue so, but my boy, my son was, I think he was about 10 or 11 at the time. And he just went, he nearly exploded. And he said, if you don't do it, I'll never forgive you. So I had to do it. But what was funny, it was like being in the secret service. We got, I remember going for my costume fitting. I still didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know which film it was. I actually thought it was Rogue One. Um, and in the car on the way there, the guy went, no, 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 Rogue One wrapped last week. We're, um, you're, in, you're in Last Jedi. And then I got there and I remember walking past all these costumes and thinking, who am I? And there was like all like the X-Wing pilot costumes. I was like, oh, maybe I'll be in the next wing. And then I went around this corner and it was all um, first order. So I was like, okay, I'm first order, fair enough. Cause I look a bit weird. And it, the best bit about it was I was acting with a guy called Adrian Edmondson, who's a very famous comedy actor from, from Britain. So, so that was a bit of a thrill, but basically I had no lines. I was just operating this comms thing. And um, the director, who was lovely, Ryan Johnson, was like, yeah, yeah, you know, I really need you to fill it because he's going to ask you a question and you just shake your head because he goes, can you hear me? And I go, no. And um, I just was basically <laughs> knocking around with stormtroopers. And, and the best bit was, you know, those little robots that go me and go around. They were real. They weren't CG'd. There was little robots going around on the floor. So, you know, if you're a Star Wars fan, you think this is great. There's a little robot. I'm chatting to the stormtroopers. This is brilliant. Um, but then the funniest bit was that we were waiting to just, you know, we're hanging around for four days and suddenly um, Luke Skywalker's on set. He's literally there holding his little dog and everyone's going, oh, look, look, there he is, there he is. And then he came over to us because he was a massive fan of Adrian Edmondson, this actor who did a series called Bottom many years ago. And he came up and then we got to meet him and he was just going, I'm just such a huge fan of Bottom. It's just amazing. And uh, we had this lovely chat with him and off he went. And Adrian Edmondson, who's kind of quite softly spoken British actor, just went, well, who'd have thought? Because we didn't think we have any scenes. We didn't have any scenes in them or anything, but what a sweet guy. And it was just so sweet, but he'd come and found Adrian Edmondson specifically to say he wow. was a fan of his show. You know, he wasn't even filming that day. He'd just come in to meet him. So lovely. Yeah, so it was very funny. But what you can see, all you can see me in the film is he goes, can you hear me? And I go, yeah, like that. And it got to, what was funny was we'd spent three days and I still hadn't done this nod. And by the end, it was like, I got there and, and, and you know, suddenly there's 200 people looking at you and all the cameras are on you because they're getting you from different angles. And Ryan Johnson came up to me and went, like, you know, it's just going to be, just say, just nod at once. No, maybe twice, nod twice when he asked you. So I, not twice, okay. And it got, I was like so self-conscious by that point that I sort of went into this Indian kind of like, he went, can he hear <laughs> I don't know, maybe. Um, 
And so then we had this joke. I was just this little Indian man on the on the bridge who all he was thinking about was his lunch. Because I've got a tiffin carrier with some dal in it. And then suddenly the Admiral was talking to me and he was like, can you hear me? I don't know. I'm not in control of this thing. Uh, that was my, if you ever watch it again, you'll see this little Indian guy <laughs> pretending to be mean, but actually he's just thinking about his lunch. Oh God. That is funny. Oh my God. <laughs> I, I can't, I have no more questions. So <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> That's really funny. Oh my God. That's hilarious. Oh. Oh. So you you worked for years on Benidorm. You did you, how long? How much of the year did you spend in away? We'd spend well. By the end, it was four four months because it would be it would be. Uh, we started at six half hour episodes and then we went up to hours and it got more and more popular. So we did more and more episodes of it. And yeah, we do four four months in Spain, which so that <laughs> so we we had a great great time. And and that particular town is a very funny town to be in because um, it's mad British on holiday. So I think they made an American version, but I can't remember what it was called. They tried to make it like a sort of how, where would the Americans go and in a similar. Um, did you know the arc of your character before you started or is it just, did it just organically kind of evolve as you got through the series? Evolved. And and then I left actually, I left to do Pirates. So I had to leave the show and then I, I, I was out, I'd left the show. So he wrote me out. Um, and then about five years later, he brought me back. He asked if I wanted to come back. So I went back and did a couple more series, which was, it was lovely to go back. But yeah, yeah, it was one of those, I mean, you knew, you know that, you played a character for a long time. You sort of love the character and you just, they become, it's sort of like, they're like your friend and yeah. you loyal to them. You know, I feel loyal. And it was that weird thing because the character's gay and he's a very out gay man. And, and what would happen is, because it's a very kind of working class show, people love it. So people come up to me and they'll go, oh, I love the show, blah, blah, blah. And then particularly maybe like older members of the public or whatever will go, but you're not really gay, are you? Or you're not really queer. So I felt disloyal saying that I wasn't because he's my, my friend, you know. So, so I just started saying, um, oh, you wouldn't be upset if I was, would you? Um, and I never, ever got a bad response to that. I never. People would always go, you know, I would have big groups of lads come up to me, big, you know, like macho. They go, no, mate, no, great, no, we're very cool with that. And, um, you know, so it was a really, it was a nice way. And once I was in Dublin airport, I was doing a job in Ireland and a young man came up to me, he was about 20. And he said, oh, you helped me come out to my parents because they didn't know any gay people, but they knew you. And I said, well, I'm like Troy, you know, and uh, he said it wasn't easy because they were very religious, but he said, but that's how I, I came up to my parents. So I texted- That's what it's all about. Yeah, I texted the writer immediately and said, this is what's happened to me. And he just, he texted back saying, I'm crying. <laughs> oh. But it's interesting because what you're, what um, Colin was saying, you know, you're going to talk about well-being and things tonight. And um, the thing I love doing at the moment most is I've sort of gradually started doing work with students, drama students in various drama schools here. Uh, where I go in and I just talk about how to stay sane and, and live with dignity as an actor because they never get taught that you know they only get taught the skills so I go in and I say look I've got 30 years of experience I'm not a teacher but I'm happy and I know how to to, to survive you know and keep yourselves sane and, and to walk into an audition where you you know you have some dignity and you, you're not just begging yeah. So I love that work. I do that. I do a few of those a year. And um, it's sort of really one of the things I enjoy the most now. Do you find that youngsters who, because I, I'm, 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 my son might want to be an actor, I'm not sure, but it's difficult to give, I mean, that's just one person, but you meet lots of youngsters. There's enormous pressure on the, on, on the ego, on, on the self, on the vanity of being, because what you, you think of being acting as being about the way you look mm. primarily, rather than about what you express the, the the things you you talk about the the great writing that you might have you might be lucky enough to to get involved with but the the focus is definitely on look in terms of acting do you find that there is a way to help kids understand the balance between because i you know even at 55 i get up some days and i'm like oh i look exactly like i feel and how depressing is that <laughs> i think what where we start is i always say to them what stories do you want to tell and so I try and start from an empowering situation. So we start when I start with them in the first year and we do, we do why the first talk I do with them is I, it's like, why art? Why have you chosen? Why have you chosen the arts? You could, if you want, you could go and make a lot of money. You could go into finance. You could go anywhere. You could be a lawyer. Why have you chosen the arts? Because just choosing the arts is an act of rebellion in this day and age. 
they don't want you to choose arts they want you to shut up earn money and consume so so why the why are and what and if you've chosen the arts why acting and for me, the question, the story has to be, what stories do you want to tell? Because stories shape our society and we are the storytellers. We're taking part in telling stories. So I say, it's not about, because the, the misconception I had when I was young was that it was all about ego and it was about wanting to be seen. And I said, that might have taken you here, but now you have to decide, how are you gonna serve the world? What's your gift? What are you gonna bring? And for you, that is possibly, if you continue in acting, it's gonna be storytelling. And so then you can get yourself out of the way. Yes, you are the product. Yes, you're gonna be cast on the way you look. Yes, all those things. That's part of the game and that has to be done. But if you can think, what stories do I want to tell? You can imagine drawing those stories to you and you can empower yourself. So when you walk into an audition, you're not saying, please give me a job because I've been working as a waiter for a, a year. You, what you're saying is I have skills to offer. I love something about your project. Um, and I want, I, I have skills to contribute to that. And if it's, if, if I'm the right person, good. And if not, I wish it well and send it on its way. And so you come from a place of empowerment and dignity all the time and saying, what am I offering? What am I offering all the time? Yeah, that's really beautiful. I mean, the, the, the reality is, I mean, acting school, I don't know if you, what your acting school was like, but my acting school was 18 students, um, probably four, 12 to 14 males. Um, the, the rest women, there were pretty people and clearly character actor people. And they were, that was kind of conditioned. Into it. And we were, you know, we, we weren't under any illusion of what, what, where we, what we were headed into. And they were like very careful about um, how we, you know, saw ourselves, and 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 I found it really unhealthy <laughs> until I got to acting school. It never occurred to me that that would be the case. In fact, I didn't really see myself fitting any of those stereotypes, to be honest. Yeah. So it it was a, a, always a struggle afterwards. And I, when I first got to Hollywood, it was like the the hunk is going to be played by Sidney El Fadil in Star Trek, and of course it was disappointing because I was anything but a hunk at the, you know, that wasn't what my, I was projecting, what my story was, if you like. So I think that those, I think that element of it, the, the, the preconceptions about who we think we are and what we should look like, really unhealthy in the acting world and really bad for actors. And I worry about for my son who's 24 and I think wants to be an actor because he's gonna get up every day, look in the mirror before he leaves the house and wonder if he looks okay. And I just think it's a really bad way to start your day. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I suppose I've been quite lucky because I've always played the uh, handsome leading man's weird mate. So, so in a way, my weirdness was something I had to, because I thought, I remember when I went up for my first ever film job while I was still at drama school, and it was a lovely old casting director who you may remember called Alan Fernando. He was Indian, actually. Oh, yeah, absolutely. He was an Indian prince. And uh, you were probably up for it. And uh, he said um, to me, he met me in London and I'd come all the way from Manchester. And he went, yes, you see, you are, what I need is a swimming across rivers prince. And you are a reading books kind of prince. <laughs> and I remember going back to drama school and thinking, oh, I've got to go to the gym. I've got to put on weight. I've got to... And then my head of school, who was brilliant actually said to me, no, you've got to be yourself because the bookish prince is gonna come along. And yeah. it, however much you try, you're not gonna get swimming across with this prince because there's gonna be someone butcher than you who's gonna get yeah. that. And so what I say to the students is, you know, first you're not competing against each other. The more you're a unit, the better your performances in the third year will be. You are a company, you are an ensemble, you are not competing against each other. Your competition right. is somewhere else. And secondly, I say, if they want you, they will choose you. And if they've chosen you, it's because you were right. So if you go in trying to second guess and make yourself prettier or make yourself this or dye your hair or whatever, you're altering the truth of who you are. And it's gonna be just a kind of toned down version of your real potential. It's not, it's, it's better to be you and then you'll get the parts that you can really sing in as opposed to being, oh, well, I'm sort of pretending to, sh I'm shoehorning myself into this role because I've been to the gym a lot, and then I'll be kind of okay at it. Yeah. But, you know, and what you did very cleverly when you went into Star Trek is you brought him to you. you yeah, luckily. Him. And that's, that's 
because you were confident in who you actually were. And, and I just say to them, be, bring your gifts, bring your gifts, because they're completely unique. Yeah, I think that's really good advice for just about any sphere of life you end up in. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just sitting here like a member of the audience, just really watching two old mates just chinwagging. It's lovely. It's really no, it's lovely to catch up with Paul. It really is. I don't see you enough, my friend. You don't. You don't. That's the you last know. time we were all together was my fiftieth, and yeah. it was it was so lovely to have the both of you there and go get talking. You two, come on. Yeah. Yeah. What I love is that because we've known each other so long, and you must all know this with old friends. We see each other and we haven't seen each other for, I don't know, three years or whatever. And then suddenly it's just like, well, it's just like we were back in Manchester, like, you know, in my flat in Manchester having a laugh. And that's, is, yeah. that's the great thing about old friends. Sid was there when I was looking after my mom, him and Shana playing with me on the game, talking to me, keeping me sane, a bit like the Zoom quiz has done. Mr. Baisley here, when he went back for Benadol the second time and my mom had just, just gone into our home. And I was just coming out of the trauma that Mr. Baisley, I'm going to probably cry again, but this is what happened. He goes, just, just get a flight, just get a cheap flight and come out here in Spain. I've got a ho I've got a, an apartment. It'll be lovely. Just come out and we'll, we'll give you a good time. I get there. He sends a car to pick me up at the airport with a lovely guy, that driver guy. <laughs> so we spent a lot of time just hanging out. And that was one of the nicest things that anybody's ever done for me. And I didn't realize at the time how much I needed that and he did because that's what mr baisley is like he's always looking out for other people and i love the fact that kids in drama schools are getting you to go in and talk to them because i cannot think of a better person to go in and educate them in all the lovely things that you do with your meditation your ethics and everything else you are genuinely one of life's utterly lovely human beings you both are and i'm very honored to know both of you and now I'll shut up and <laughs> <laughs> thank you colin thanks mate over to you Mel. well now, yeah now it's got awkward does, does anybody want to jump in and ask a question of um of paul while we've got him did yeah. you all coordinate your outfits <laughs> yeah it looks like it <laughs> this is what i was saying it's the weird thing is this like i'll like we've shown up looking a bit, a bit similar and it's like uh, it's like when this woman said to me, do you know my, it's really weird, you really remind me of my flatmate. I think we sort of, there was something went on in that year when we lived together that was sort of, we slightly absorbed. <laughs> we became each other. Yeah, I've got a bit of Sid going on, like always. You know? <laughs> I, was, I was wondering um, if, uh, if Paul, if you've ever done any uh, collaboration with your wife, Charlotte. I have, I've done, uh, actually I've only ever done some radio that she's written. <clears throat> She's, um, she's a very uh, instinctive writer and she was an actor, that's how we met. Uh, and then I remember when she switched to writing and she'd get into a kind of trance when she was writing. And I remember her first telly that she wrote and I was doing, I doing the thing that I never do anymore because it's fatal. I was looking over her shoulder at the characters and I was going, oh, I could play that guest lead in that episode. It was some possible series. And this is what she did. She looked at me and she went, I don't see it that way. And I, and I said to her, you've crossed to the dark side and you're not one of us anymore. So I never, we never try, try never to um, ask her <laughs> because, because what she does is she, she writes so beautifully and she never writes for people. She writes what's in her heart. Uh, and I think that is the only way to really write. And she's got some very exciting, she's working on some lovely film projects actually at the moment. So yeah, watch this space because hopefully there'll be some uh, some uh, movies that, that are coming out with her name on them soon. How is it being married to um, one of the most, known to be one of the most talented people in the country? Yeah, it is weird because when she first, because she was a brilliant actor and I really liked, was one of the things that made her so attractive. You know, I just thought, wow, she's really good. And then she, the first place she wrote was literally because she was trying to change agents because her acting wasn't going so great. And um, she sat down and she'd, she, she'd, she'd been talking with a mate about it and they were going to write it together. And then this mate got a tour and she went off. And I went, just write it yourself. All those ideas in your notebook are yours anyway. So she, we borrowed a computer. We didn't have a computer. We borrowed a computer off a friend. And she wrote this thing like she was in a trance. I could literally put my hand in front of her face while she was writing. And I got it at the end when she'd wrote, finished it. And I remember reading it and I remember looking at her. We'd been together about five years then, four years. And I remember thinking... 
I don't know who you are because I, I don't know how this, uh, I thought it would be okay, but it was like brilliant. And it's still done. That first play is still performed. It's called Air Swimming and it's a two-hander and it's still performed in, uh, particularly in Europe quite a lot. But what I love is that she's just someone who, she really doesn't have any, you know, she doesn't think she's as good as anyone else. And she worries all the time. And uh, she's, you know, she has quite low self-esteem often. And like a lot of writers, she's very thin skinned. So she can portray the world because she feels it. She's, she's, a, she's a, you know, one of these hypersensitive people. Yeah. The problem with that is that it's quite hard to defend yourself against that. You know, you walk into a room and if, you know, I know if we walk into a room, the traumatised person will find Charlotte really quickly because she just draws people to her. And I remember once we were in a hotel, a really crowded hotel in Austria. We'd taken the kids, the kids were little. And she was looking around this full restaurant at dinner and she looked at this man with his two little kids. And she said, he was halfway across the restaurant and she went, I'm really worried about him. I, I think his wife's not with him and I said she's probably going to be down in a second you don't we've never seen them before you know weirdly we got chatting to him that evening and his wife had just died like he was really young he was like 28 he had two tiny kids his wife had yeah. died and she has this kind of psychic ability and I think that's what all you know a lot of great writers have is they have this yeah. they just tune into humanity and then they can express it and thank God for them, because otherwise the actors would have nothing to do. So, you know. Is it difficult working? Because you obviously have to go away whenever you work, nearly every single time, for weeks on end. Um, she doesn't get to go away very often because she writes, as most writers do, at home. Two children growing up, obviously, they're just getting old enough now to leave the house, but they're, they've oh, not been for years and years. I mean, how does that work? Because you end up always really away. Cool. Yeah, and all I could do was when I was at home, I did everything. So when I was at home, I thought this is her time. So I would cook all the food, I would look after the kids. Uh, I would do everything that I could yeah. to facilitate her to have a nine to five working day. Um, because when I was not there, and the problem was, as, as you well know, I, could some, I would sometimes, I would ring her up and go, um, I've just been told I might need my passport because I might be going away next week. Uh, and I know you had all those things planned and that would be it, I'd be gone. I could be in a different country. I'd certainly be in a different city. And it was very difficult, but you know, what was wonderful was a, a, a lovely old lady that we met once. She was an artist, but she'd been a teacher all her life. And she said to, to us, you know, you're both very lucky because you've brought up children and you're both living the artistic life. You're blessed. And it was a really beautiful thing. And it made us realize how that we had done it. We'd managed it. And yeah. um, now it's difficult sometimes, but at the same time, you know, we made it work and we paid the mortgage and uh, sometimes she was earning more and sometimes I was earning more. And uh, Two lovelier children you couldn't hope to meet. Lovely kids. So, you know, we've done really well. I think the crucial thing now is that we have models that we always followed our dream. And so now hopefully, like our, both our kids are really interested in what they are interested in. And yeah. I've always said to them, don't worry about money, don't worry about anything, follow what you love and something yeah. will happen to you. Even if you have to come and live with us, follow what you love. And hopefully, you can't say that to kids, you just got to model it really. Um, so. yeah. You've got to walk the walk, as they say. I, I'm with, are you going to hang out with us for a little while and, and, yeah. and, and meet a couple of our guys? Oh, Jennifer's got something to say. Thank you for taking the time to, to come and hang out with us. You seem like a delightful human being, which is moderately unsurprising because Sid tends to collect those types of folks because like attracts like. Years and years ago, um, you did an adaptation of Canterbury Tales. <laughs> do you remember that? I do. I okay. do because I was with, worked with the absolutely beautiful and gorgeous Indira Varma. Uh, and um, yeah, I had, a one, I had a really small plot playing a mad person. I remember I had a very mad bow tie. I was trying to chat her up at a party or something. And it was, the I've worked with her a lot ever since, but it was the first time I'd ever met her. And I was, she just was the most beautiful person I'd ever seen. And I was thinking, well, I'm just basically being my character because I can't even speak to her. She's, you know, and actually we're mates now. So that's good. But yeah, I do. Why did you, did you have you seen it? I, I have a couple of degrees in medieval studies. So I'm always really excited when um, those things make it into more pop culture. And um one of the things that I that I did want to ask you about is is a if you had read them before the tales, um, but b if you had how how that worked in your head because like Shakespeare people do modern adaptations all the time 
Canterbury Tales, not so much. Yeah, that's true. And and because they, what was great about that series was that they'd completely reimagined them. And it's something you can't do with Shakespeare because you can't change the language. But, you know, if you're um, in America or England, you can do it with, say, Moliere or Chekhov or whatever, because you're translating it. Uh, Chaucer's the same. We're translating him because he didn't speak our language. So I think it lends itself to, to having that freedom with him. But he was a master storyteller. You know, he knew how to entertain people because he was entertaining people. You know, he was a showman. He was entertaining people on the road. We don't really know how he operated, but he was, you know, he was living on his wits. And so I didn't read them because I thought, actually, I should be concentrating on what this is. Uh, you know, this story, this version of it. So I just concentrated on that. But um, but I have since. So, uh, you know, I've dipped in and out. I mean, you know, yeah, I, I think I think he should be done more, actually. But he should be done in a way that's always relevant to a modern audience, because unless you're doing a museum piece, unless you're doing it specifically as a peer, you know, like for a, a historical reenactment or something, I think all these stories only work if you if you tell them as if they're relevant to a modern, what, what is relevant to a modern audience? Again, why are we telling the story? Because if it's not relevant, we should, we don't need to tell it anymore. Often though, that what's the, the very fact that there are resonances between something written in 15, uh, 14, 15, the century, whatever time, the resonances themselves are what make it relevant. Hmm. It, it's that we were thinking about this 600 years ago, and we still haven't got to an answer. We still haven't figured it out. And, and, and they master uh, observers of the human condition. That's why they've lasted, you know, Chaucer, yeah. Chekhov. They were master observers of the human condition and the human condition doesn't change. So, yeah, yeah. I have a silly question, if that's okay. Oh, silly questions are in, 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 no, incredibly no. important. They're the best. How was Sid as a roommate? He was, you know, he was so nice and he smelled <laughs> really good. I remember he had this, um, he had, <laughs> He had, because I used to use this terrible kind of cheap antiperspirant. I can't remember what it was now, but um, I'm sure I was getting carcinogens from it, you know. And he, I remember he, all he had in the bathroom was like a little bottle from Neil's yard of sandalwood oil. And he'd pop a bit in his bath and he'd kind of, oh, Sid, Sid smells so good. And he doesn't, you know, he's like, he's just like one of those people. He was just polite. He introduced me to real basil because I was really common and all I'd ever used was basil. <laughs> basil out of a bottle and he was like uh no we can have basil leaves in a sandwich you know this is the early 90s and I was like can we is that not and, it was <laughs> delicious. and he was you know so he was just he made really nice tea <laughs> <laughs> just like I I sat because I was like I'm quite from a I'm from a lower middle class immigrant background from Croydon and you won't know Croydon maybe but it's pretty rough and suddenly I was with this guy, I was thinking, oh, this is great. This is like Brides had revisited. It's fantastic. So yeah, he was my introduction <laughs> to civilization, basically. <laughs> That's nonsense. <laughs> we were ideal roommates because um, we both had the same relative sensitivity to things. We both were very, con very concerned with what other people, how other people felt. And uh, it wasn't like one of us sort of embarrassed the other watching TV or something by we saying did, something. We did laugh an awful lot. And, you know, he was so down to earth. What was so wonderful? I remember he'd never mentioned his family. And I remember the first time we had a, you know, in the old days, you'd have a tape, a tape voice machine from for the phone. So it would be on a cassette tech. And it was mine, I remember. And I came home and I listened to the answer machine and Malcolm McDowell was leaving us a message. And I was like, Jesus Christ, Malcolm McDowell's leaving us a message. He's like, yeah, he's Malcolm. I was like, what? I kept that. I was like, that's dead. <laughs> and then Mary Steenbergen was leaving us messages. Hi, Sid, you're Annie Mary. I was like, what? <laughs> but I had no idea because he was just so kind of like, he just never, it was like, it's just my auntie, you know? So that was great, you know? And I was like, I was ringing my mum, going, Mary Steenbergen's just left us a message. <laughs> can i ask one very quick one um yeah, you split course. off my nostalgia for manchester i lived there for 15 years so do you have any silly stories manchester. I, mean, I worked just around the corner from the library theater oh my um, god and i only moved to london because i had to for work because i loved it and late 80s manchester i just thought well i am in the center of the universe i remember watching new order at the hacienda 
and I'd only just got there. It was a small, you know, they're, they're only playing to a few hundred people. And I was in the Hacienda watching the order and I just thought, this is, it can't get any better than this. This is, I am in the center of the universe. And you'd meet people from all over the world and they'd go, you're from Manchester, that's amazing. Yeah. It was just the most, it was quite grubby and it was rained all the time, but it was, yeah. it was a creative hothouse. And I love that city. I still love it now. I mean, it looks completely different now. It's very, got a lot of money and whatever, but it's a, you can still find those kind of slightly sort of shabby parts. And it's, it's a wonderful, if you ever come to England, go, go, go and visit all of you, go, go and have a little look around Manchester, Manchester, Liverpool, the great Northern cities. They're so different to everything in the South of England. And they, they're just so full of character. There's a slight feeling of rebellion in the air always, yeah. you know, in those northern cities. And I was just like, I'm filming in Liverpool at the moment, you know, and it's so great being back in Liverpool. And again, you know, Liverpool has this really, it's just a different subculture and they just, they, they do things a bit differently there. And it's, they're great, great cities. Earlier you were talking about how um, to uh, find your place in, like, an important part of acting is to figure out what stories you want to tell. And I'm curious for both of you, uh, what stories do you guys want to tell? Good question. Really put me on the spot there. And Paul? Well, I've thought about this quite a lot because of the work I do with the students. And I've realised that for me, culturally at the moment, there's a big um, transition. You wouldn't, I wouldn't I want to call it conflict between two stories. There's a story of the modern civilization that we live in that's been running for a few thousand years, which is the story, I would call it the story of separation, where everyone's against everyone, Darwinian, um, uh, what's best for you might not be best for me, so we're gonna have to compete for scarce resources. It's a story of scarcity. And it fuels a lot of our stories. It fuels a lot of like, you know, there's a baddie and the only way to finish the movie is to kill the baddie. Um, they can never be redeemed, <clears throat> you know, and, there's another story, which is new, which a lot of people call the new story. It, it fuels nonviolence, it fuels Gandhi, but it's also an ancient story. A lot of indigenous cultures have a story of connectedness, where we are connected to each other and we're connected to nature. And what happens to me happens to you in some strange way. And so if you think about that story, what is good for you has to be good for me, even if it doesn't appear that way on the surface. And what is bad for you has to be bad for me. So I always, when I read a script, I always try and go, is this part of the new story or part of an old story? And, and you know, often they're a bit of both. And so then you have to go, do I think this is enough telling that new story that I want to be part of this story? And um, if you do, go for it. And if you don't, I, I, I'm, you know, I empowered myself by saying, I don't want to help tell that story because I think it's part of an old polarized, you know, like you look at the world now, we see how polarized things are and it's all part of the old story. What we realize is, you know, when we realize that we're all completely connected to each other and to the world and to nature, then you can't be polarized because eventually, you know, there's just us and a problem and we're all on the same side. And, you know, even if a story on the surface looks like it's really violent and dark, say a story like Macbeth, but actually it's a story about how a human being walks down a path of separation and is destroyed by it. That to me is a new story story because it's telling a story of actual redemption. Um, so sometimes you have to look really hard underneath the lines to see what the real story is. And what's interesting is I found once I've had that lens, which is for about the past 10 years, I don't know how it works, but the universe seems to bring them to me. I, so I find more and more that I'm doing, I do comedy that I love, I do, I find things, stories that come to me and I go, yeah, I can, I can help tell that. So I think if you really know what you really want to be doing and not in a superficial way, like, oh yeah, I'd like to be in an action movie or I'd like to be, I mean, that's fine as well, but it's not, it's not quite deep enough. It's like, what, but what do you really want to say? And then you'll find, you know, people think actors are helpless, but I find more and more that I can make a difference by what I choose to do. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in the second story, and I'm not too familiar with uh, your work. I'm wondering, is there anything that you've been a part of that you think really exemplifies what you see as the second story, so that I can watch it? Let's have a think. You know what I watched the other day, which was really like this? What is that new film that Kristen Wiig's in? Vista Del Mar, yeah. Watch that movie, because I tell you what's amazing about that movie, is it's two beautiful people who love each other, who, it's really mad, it's a really mad film. They go on a mad adventure. 
and I don't want to tell you what happens, but the resolution will make you, if you watch it, watch the resolution, how they resolve the conflict at the end of that story. And you'll go, that's a new story story. And it's hilarious. And there is conflict in it, but it's resolved in such a beautiful way. And I remember watching that thinking, yes, those are the stories I want to be part of. Um, and often it helps when you watch something and you go, yes, I love that one because of that. No, I don't like that. Why? Because something it's telling me something underneath. So I'll have a think if there's anything I've done. Like I'll, I'll have a think while, while you're all talking and I'll see. But that's a great question. I have a similar experience. to I'm Actually, I think what I the stories that I'm interested in conflate with Paul's on a different but from coming from a slightly different angle. I've been obsessed with the nature of identity for, wow, most better part of my adult life. I just have found ways to hone that down, distill that, figure out what that means to me more. I just was a bit more kind of broad stroked about it in the early days. And I think that once you can break down those notions of identity and start playing characters that make people think differently about tropes they've already come, think they've made up their mind about then you start expanding people's horizons because actors have an astonishing privilege of being invited into people's living rooms on other people's terms. So I, I, I'm not barging my way into someone's house. Someone is inviting me, even out of curiosity, even for 20 minutes before they change the channel. They've, I've got a shot at, getting, at, at saying something. Um, and that isn't usually my words. It's usually my persona it's usually the, the the impression one gets as you pass someone in the street and if you can make that impression count um, on some level especially if you get to stop for a second and say hi then you've got a chance at, at touching someone in a way that maybe appeals to them and I think we've even talked to the in the social club about identity quite a bit and that's no coincidence you know because both Mel and I are really interested in the subject and We've got lots of different pockets of interesting people from lots of different groups, but together we're quite strong <laughs> to make it as an understatement. And I think actors can help knit us together if, if, and, and writers especially, but actors have to do the hard work of, of, being, of getting invitations into people's rooms. You don't normally invite writers into your room, except the, through books and poetry and wonderful things like that, but in terms of entertainment, um, you, that, yeah, that's usually your go-to. Um, so from that point of view, I, I'm completely, I'm, I'm, I'm exactly like Paul. And there is a universality to that in the sense that, but if, we, if we're divided, we don't have a shot of it. And, and, you, know, and you know, some of you that have been here for a few months, that, that absolutely, that's absolutely the way I think there's a un, united front. We're very, very, very powerful. Um, and it just, but it, we can't be bickering into me sign you know. So I think that's, a, I'm sorry, I'm just basically saying I, I agree with Paul. Yeah, so I see how like identity um, and expanding the ideas that people have about it fit into the second world that Paul is talking about. So your ideas really go together and I, I appreciate both of them. Thank you so much. Because I, th I think that if you, what I really believe and what I say to the young actors is, I do a talk to them about building a character and I say, for me, building character is, when you look at someone, think of the person that you can think about that is beyond the pale. It might be a politician, it might be a criminal, it might be some, someone really bad. Can you imagine living in their shoes for all their life, from when they were a little beautiful little baby to the moment where we are now? And it might be hard and it might be troubling, but if you can really do it, you can not just sympathize or go, oh, I see why they did that terrible thing. It's like, I would have done that thing as well. If I'd had the totality of their experience, think of your least favorite politician, I would have been that person. And then you can think of them with some compassion and then <clears throat> for actors, you can play them. But even, but for everyone, you can go, okay, I see what's made that person that person. And, and, and I think that's so crucial, being able to think, can I walk in that person's shoes? Um, and, and just to answer your question, I've just done a comedy that you that, that really I felt was very new story. It's a, a Netflix comedy. It hasn't come out yet. I think it's coming out in about June. Uh, but it's by a brilliant young comedian called Mae Martin. I don't know if any of you have heard of her. She's Canadian, uh, but she's based in Britain. She's non-binary 
and a lot of her humour comes from that. Um, May Martin, and she's got a series that has, or she did series one of this show called Feel Good. And I'm in the second, I got part in the second series, which we've just finished filming, and I think is coming out on Netflix in June. So when that comes out, it's called, it's by May Martin, and it's called Feel Good. Have a little look at that, because that for me is a kind of really beautiful story that is compassionate and, you know. So it, it sort of, it sort of harks back to um, where, when people were talking after the after one of the fan fiction plays and somebody somebody mentioned that acting has a lot to do with like physicality and stuff more than it has to do with lines and, and, and stuff like that. And what would you say to like someone who maybe their body doesn't work so well as, as That's a other? really good point. That's a good point, Ash. I'll just fill Paul in on the conversation because I remember the conversation we were having. And um, there was we had a Paul, we basically had a conversation about acting and de delivering lines and how to put scenes together in, in, in a different context in a, a show that we were doing for, for this Zoom um, over a few weeks. And one of the statements that came out, and I think I said it, is that you act with your whole body. And it's very hard when, you, when you're when you just acting with some element of it. So th I think that's what you're referring to, Yash. So it's, it, I think, I don't think the status of your body, broken as you might call it or not, is actually one of the things that it disqualifies you from acting with your body. <laughs> I think you bring your whole body to the party in whatever shape it's in, whatever form it's in, um, because it's an essential part of your, of, of, it's one of the reinforcements to, to, to the things you're, you're trying to say. Um, so uh, you can often tell actors who are too cerebral, um, and I'm one of them a lot of the time, in the sense that um, they leave their bodies behind and, and they're acting just, they're hoping you get excited by the, the silver tongue, <laughs> the way they say their word. All of this truth is, is whatever shabby body we have um, is excluded. And, but I think the shabby body has to be part of the conversation. And, it's, and, and it's a, it gets a bit easier as you get older. It's very hard when you're very young because we are so body conscious and body religious um, that it, it's, it, it's very hard to overcome that. It's just about a complete wholeness that you bring to the table, that you, you, you say, you, you, you talk with, you, you express yourself with. So dancers understand that, except they don't use their voice so much. Um, and actors tend to use their voice and tend to leave their body somewhere else, but you can, you've got to bring all of it. And it doesn't really matter about the status of your body. And I think I've discovered more and more as I've got older that if you don't bring all of yourself, you will be, your performance will be somehow muted. So when I was younger, I thought I had to look a certain way, be a certain way. As an Indian heritage person, I thought I had to pretend to be white a lot of the time. You know, subconsciously, I would be like, uh, you know, oh, I've, I've got to just sort of, I'm in, a, I'm in a Shakespeare now, so I've got to be really English. And what I've realised is, my most interesting performances is when I, I bring everything. I'm really skinny. I've got a weirdly long neck. It's like, that's how my, when I bring that truth is when I'm interested as a performer. And if you don't bring all of yourself, that's, the, that's what's so beautiful about acting because you can go and watch Hamlet all your life because every actor, if they're good, has brought themselves to the part. So you can watch the same play again and again and again, and every actor is completely unique. And, and it's why it's subjective as well. So you and I could watch a play and I'll go, that person was brilliant. And you'll go, I thought they were rubbish. And we're both right, because it's, it's just what struck, struck our hearts. And we didn't even know why we loved that person or we hated that person, something hit us. And that's the point of 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 it you know and so if you can bring yourself really feel that freedom to bring yourself to a role firstly you will love it when i was in benadorm the character i was playing as i said he was a very out gay person and he was not afraid to be it in public and my character was always we were set around a pool and i always had the smallest briefs you've literally ever seen <clears throat> and I'm, I've always been incredibly body conscious, like very embarrassed to take my clothes off, you know. And I remember going to the costume designer and going, these, these briefs are too small, but they're like children's briefs. And she said, 
what would Troy wear? And I thought, and she totally had me because I knew he would just, and I literally, I used to go down in a dressing gown and I used to take off the dressing gown. And sometimes the other actors would go, oh my God, well done. And I used to sit there thinking, <laughs> not only am I in public, I'm on national TV, basically, you know, virtually naked. But because I was him, because I was trying to serve him, I could bring myself to that role. And if I hadn't been able to, if I'd been ashamed of it somehow, I wouldn't have done him a service, you know. So I just think bringing yourself, and it can be the most um, cathartic thing you'll ever do, really being honest and going to the world, this is who I am and this is what I'm bringing to this character. Actors are lucky, we get to exercise these ghosts. But I mean, both Paul and I are similar in the sense that we were both devastatingly ashamed of our bodies when we were young men. And, and I still am. <laughs> Okay, that's not the approach I was going to take with that, but that's fine, Colin, that's fine. Thank you, everybody who asked questions, and the, this has been a fantastic conversation, um, just really amazing. Paul, thank you so much for your conversation. It really ended up fitting in with our theme of self-care and self-defense uh, in, in some really amazing ways, so that's, that's awesome. Um, Sid, did you want to talk a little bit about the big news for this week? I have a and I've been offered, when it rains, it pours. I've been offered another job. I've got, I've got a month off. And then I am going to do a, a, an adaptation of a, a novel uh, called Shantaram. Um, I've never read it. Uh, I know that apparently my character dies. <laughs> I'm now wondering whether that's why I got the job. That it's eight months in another country, but all of April, I'm going to be around for that, most of that anyway. Um, so there you go. Yes, so Sid will be here in April when he, after he wraps on the current project. So we'll be business as usual in April. Uh, we'll be celebrating our one-year milestone in the social club. That happens in April. Yeah, it yeah. does. I remember when we thought this would go on for maybe a couple of months. I know. God, no. I know. <sighs> we will be wrapping up the, uh, the current iteration of the social club. We'll wrap up. But we do have a lot of other very cool things in the works. Uh, we we will be um, evolving, is what we're like. We're trying. We're we're saying is we'll be evolving. So the social club will not go away entirely. It will just look different. So that's the big news. Um, and we also we weren't expecting it to be announced quite so soon either. So we had I had this whole plan of the timing of it and everything. That's true. Well, at least I can say I'm doing it. Hey, that, yeah. they've done that. So once they've said something, I can say it off. Yeah, but of course you do know they only got sick because they couldn't get Paul. I know. That's why? That's why I'm <laughs> there. It's that simple. Thanks to Paul, wherever he is. He's hanging out. Thank you, Paul. He's Thank you. There. An absolute delight. It was great. What a lovely community you've got here. Thank it you. It really is. Yeah. Really nice. Everybody is brilliant. You come back as much as you want. You'll get to know everybody. All right. <laughs> Thanks again to everybody who presented and especially to Paul for joining us today. Um, thanks. You are welcome anytime, sir. And we will see you all next week. Bye. 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 Stay safe, everyone. Bye. Bye.